You've done this 200 acres here, over the west of this ridge. Here's the creek. The boundary fence is here. I get it. Good. We'll carry on with this section up here. Then this face wants doing. Go right back to the bush here. Okay. That'll finish your place, won't it, Harold? Mm -hmm. Yes. Fine. I've got another job for you this afternoon. That farm across the river. Oh, sure. But uh, finish this place up for Harold first. I wouldn't have their job on the quits. Two of the best chaps I've got. They've done a hundred tons this morning. Mm hmm. About a thousand acres. Place is looking pretty good. Hmm. We've both come a long way, haven't we? I'll soon be running twice the number of sheep up here. You know, it's wonderful what top dressing has done for the hill country. When I think what it used to be like, half the hill farms in the country were bad, rough, dirty, worn out. They were deteriorating everywhere. The pasture thinned. It didn't have any roots anymore to hold it together. After the rain, I'd find the evidence I dreaded. The signs that the farm, which had to support us all, was on the move. And mind you, I'd seen what had happened on other places. The hill country was falling apart. The early settlers felled the bush and burnt it. The ash fertilized the hills for a time. But now the land was exhausted, finished. And here we were, stuck with it. Everywhere, waste and destruction. The topsoil was sliding down off the hills. And then we started to lose the lush valleys too, as they began to fill with silt. And there was nothing we could do about it. Things were so serious that by 1947, erosion had become a national problem. And the government set up a committee to see if anything could be done about it. They investigated and they talked, you know. And finally, it all led to something like this. Fertilizer would grow grass on the hills and hold them. How are you going to get the fertilizer up there? It's too steep to do it with machines. Spread it by hand. What, on 15 million acres? <laughs> Could we uh, drop this stuff down, spread it from the air? <laughs> It looked like everybody had problems around about then, including me. I was out of the Air Force. I was restless. Somehow, I just didn't seem to be getting anywhere. And then, funny how a chance meeting can change your life. Cheers. You glad you got out? No. Things are crooked. I've got worries, man. You have. You should see the mess I'm in out at the station. All my schedule's upset. And all because some government wallers want to shove a hopper up a bomber. Look, why don't you come out tomorrow? Well, I've got a job out Sanson way. Never mind that. Look, come out tomorrow and see what goes on in the peacetime setup. Well, 
No, come on. Okay. was, I found out, that the Air Force was making a test for the Soil Conservation Boys. Apparently some bloke thought fertiliser could be spread from a plane, and he'd persuaded the council to take a gamble, to risk 600 quid to prove it. Air Force engineers had taken up the challenge to see if the thing was technically possible, and this was what was upsetting old Mac's training schedule. But everyone agreed that it was important, because the future of the hill country hung on what happened on that September day in 1948. I'm sure we can control this erosion if we can only drop phosphate from the air. We've rigged up this hopper and we're putting it in the bomber so we can get the stuff up into the air all right. But nobody knows how it's going to come down. They've got to get an even spread and they've got to get just over two and a half hundred weight to the acre. They reckon it'll fall like the gentle rain onto the farms beneath. Well, I hope they're right. <coughs> we're putting these trays out at regular intervals. They'll catch the phosphate and we'll be able to measure how even the distribution's been. Of course it might all fall out in the lump, and that'll be the end of that. <laughs> Danger zero four, clear to take. Well, here we go. Stream's got it. It's spreading it out into a fine clear. Yeah, the thing's possible. <laughs> that lot's headed straight out to sea. Hmm. I wonder how fish react to super phosphate. It's this fine super. It's too light. Too light. Yes, perhaps. Well, granulated phosphate's coarser, the particles are bigger. This heavier stuff might be the answer. This load should not only spread, but reach the ground as well. Again, failure. It looks to me as if the whole thing's a washout. The heavier fertilizers come down all right, but not in the measuring trays. The rising wind's blown it onto the runway. To calculate the distribution's impossible. But wait, those hexagonal paving slabs, they're all the same size. Can they weigh how much landed on each? Use them instead of the trays to calculate the evenness of distribution? And from this information, can they prove the feasibility of the whole idea? We've done it. The graph we've prepared shows an almost perfect curve. In other words, we've got an even distribution of two and a half hundred weight per acre, which is exactly what we wanted. Few people realized then that the curve on that piece of paper meant the birth of a new farming age. But we had to get the fact more widely known. For our next trial, we chose 10 farms, about a thousand acres. And this trial got the publicity we were after. Farmers and observers came from everywhere. Everything went according to plan. This trial was an impressive success. The ideas were proved and publicly. Then 
Out on the Wairarapa Hills there, we suddenly realised we'd not only found a way to check erosion, it looked as though we'd unexpectedly found a way of increasing production everywhere. They can do up to a thousand acres a day. Yes, and they reckon it only cost five quid a tonne. Mm. Wool prices aren't too bad. I could get super on the whole place. Well, Jim says it just appears from nowhere. They turn on a tap and there you are. Grace. Our hill country problem won't be a problem at all with all this aerial top dressing. That's right. You're wasting your time, man. What you need over this country is a plane. What do you mean? You'll be able to do something with that steep back country, too. Plane? Yeah, that's what you want, a plane. And I suddenly realized that's what I wanted, too. Not a spanner, a joystick again. That was around 1949, when you could buy an obsolete tiger moth for two or three hundred pounds. Farmers everywhere now were clamoring for aerial top dressing. And enterprising young men, a lot of them like me back from the war, were starting up and taking to the air again. When the first trials proved successful, it was taken for granted that large planes, operated by the government from commercial airfields, would save the hill country. But they'd reckoned without the dung dusters. No one even dreamt that it was possible to do what these young men did. Instead of using aerodromes miles away, they flew their light planes from strips right on the farms themselves. They landed practically anywhere. They took off with their heavy loads wherever they could find a reasonably smooth slope. Everything was rough and ready in those days. Loading equipment was practically non-existent, or what there was was pretty primitive, but they had the help and encouragement of the Civil Aviation Administration, and they made turnarounds of only three minutes from takeoff to takeoff. The amount of fertilizer they spread was amazing. Many pilots made 120 turnarounds, dropped 60 tons a day each. the foresight of the Director of Civil Aviation, official red tape was loosened and the pilots themselves were made responsible for regular checking and maintenance. This enabled the pioneers to get started. A new sound shattered the quiet of the farms and echoed back among the hills. the crazy days. With limited airstrips, no insurance and obsolete planes, the pilots were trying to find a way of working. They were experimenting, learning to fly all over again. The technique they ultimately developed was based on low flying. They followed the contours of the hills, dropping their loads in accurate swathes to give an even spread. new enterprises, things didn't always go according to plan. But the pioneers came out of their difficulties successfully and soon had both feet on the ground again. That was the end of chapter one. The slapdash days were over. The industry was organizing. Engineers and mechanics worked around the clock to keep the planes in the air and to give the farmers an uninterrupted service. Aircraft designed here by our pilots for the job they had to do were manufactured overseas and assembled in New Zealand. Aerial farming had become big business. A new farming age had dawned. And today, there are 60 companies operating over 300 aircraft. At first light, the planes and pilots go out to the farms 
where they spread half a million tons of fertilizer a year on more than four million acres. The farmers too have organized themselves as plains become the tractors of the hill country. Landing strips have been levelled on 8,000 farms. Many of the run holders have got together and made collective airstrips from which planes can work their adjacent farms. Top dressing came first, and it's the most important part of the story, but still only a part. To make use of the new pastures, we've got to control grazing. And for that, we need wire and posts. The fencing material is hoisted and secured in racks. Wire and barbed wire are loaded, together with metal posts and battens designed for the job. Any particular bundle can be released by pressure on a button on the pilot's control column. The bundles are packed and delivered in such a way that the material itself arrives undamaged. Releases are timed so accurately and the plane is handled so skillfully that the bundles are skidded onto the spot almost one on top of the other. Without roads or vehicles, Everything for a new fence line is quickly out on the job, ready for the fencing gang. And on thousands of miles of ridges, tight, permanent fences are dividing up the new pastures. We're using less conventional aircraft in some areas. The first settlers brought gorse with them from England for hedges. But in many districts it took possession of the country, and we've been fighting it for generations ever since. But now we're waging the war from the air. We're eradicating poor pastures this way too, then sowing good grasses and clovers from the air to replace them. The draft from the copters swirls the deadly spray downward, smothering every inch of every twig. The days of the gorse and thistles are numbered and soon the fugitive grasses will return from their long exile. In other parts of New Zealand, aircraft are delivering loads of fresh chopped carrots. On the first day, they're tempting and delicious, and the next morning, they're gone. But on the second day, the succulent pieces are poisoned, and the casualties are heavy. The end of the rabbits, which have been devastating whole provinces, is now in sight. To control disease is difficult sometimes with certain crops, potatoes, for instance, with their close, banked-up rows. But not now. Mixed fungicides and insecticide are spread just after dawn, when the dusts adhere to the dew-soaked leaves. Really first-class flying by an experienced pilot. 60 acres finished. Time, half an hour before breakfast. In the south, nearer the mountains, sheep need additional feed in winter. The farmers, some of them flying their own planes, drop concentrated pellets. And the interesting thing is that as soon as the sheep hear the plane, they make for where they think the feed will land. The stock too are adapting themselves to the air age. In fertile valleys in the mountains, farmers are completely isolated and depend for everything on small, efficient planes which come in over the high passes. During the year, they bring in tons of stores and equipment. Piece by piece, they've hauled in the tractors, all the farm machinery, the hydroelectric plants. And on the return flights, they take out the product of the farms, the Corridale wool. Every pound in special bales is flown up over the mountains and down to the cities. Even the shearing shed was brought in by air. Every piece of wood and iron, each nail and bolt, all the machines and equipment came from the sky. Without the aeroplane, these remote mountain pastures would have to be abandoned. Cattle are run on sheep stations in the South Island, 
grazing on the hills and valley flats. The annual muster lasts for weeks in this rough country, for mobs of cattle can take a lot of finding on 40,000 acres. Valuable time can be lost riding out to some of the remoter valleys. Now, from the air, the back country is searched and the location of the herds radioed down to the men. They plan the muster then, accordingly. And it's ahead of schedule this year, thanks to the aeroplane. The freight involved in getting fertiliser to airstrips in isolated places sometimes makes top dressing expensive. Here we're using the larger planes, which can work more economically from aerodromes miles away. They apply the fertiliser in swathes and can dust 40 acres with one load. Large aircraft are being used too where we can't make strips right on the job, in swamp areas for instance. These planes can load, perhaps 60 miles away, take on board five tons of lime at a time and apply it evenly and accurately within a few minutes. Vast areas of drained swamp where it would be impossible to work with vehicles are being reclaimed from the air. On the great wastes in the north, which have been infertile and useless for thousands of years, the scrub is burnt, then grasses and clovers are sown from the air. Then, with fertiliser, is mixed minute quantities of the life-giving chemicals, which are missing from the mineral-hungry soil. Within five years, a miracle occurs. From out of the dry, useless rubble from the old volcanoes comes deep, lush pasture. Thousands of acres of new land is created out of what for generations has been wilderness. There's new green everywhere. Yes, it's quite a story. And it's all taken place in 10 short years. One of the earliest forms of human endeavor, farming, mm -hmm. has got together with one of the newest, flying. And we're changing the whole pattern of farming in this country. But the most spectacular results have come from top dressing on hill country like mine. Pioneers in the valleys couldn't see what lay beyond the hills. They didn't foresee that the aeroplane would be bringing new life to the hills, to the swamps, the wilderness. That the sound of propellers would be the signal for grass to grow and crops to flourish. Today, the white trails drifting down onto our two long islands are part of the farming landscape as New Zealand gets new land from the sky.